He's going to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. He's going to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. He's going to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. Dev, what have you done? <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Disaster Peace Publishing House. I'm Dev Soliday. I am Cy Metz. And this is a show about the good and bad, but mostly bad, of weird internet literature. Dramatic, Dramatic readings, readings included. included. So I'd like to tell you, Sai, about the Cabbage Preacher. Who's... But, but before we get into this, I just want to say, I came off of an 11-hour shift one night, <laughs> oh. and Dev just sends me this wall of text and an image and I about what we're about to get into today, and I just responded... No. <laughs> uh, not because I'm not excited about it, but because I felt like I was just so tired, my brain rejected this information, <laughs> and I was incapable of, of uh, internalizing it. So yeah. we'll get into it today. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about the writings of an internet author who goes by The Cabbage Preacher. They claim to have no gender for all intents and purposes. I think they just want us to believe they're an actual cabbage. Their bio on Royal Road <laughs> reads, um, the cabbage preacher, grand preacher of all brassicans, autocrat of all Lahanazites, protector of Estland and Lutivolivia, righteous owner of the entire planet and its moon, <laughs> vanquisher of lettuce loving heathens, first only and last of their name. Um, so that, will give you the idea of the kind of tone we're going to be dealing with prose-wise. Mm -hmm. um, it's... I, I, I'm fascinated by this Grandiose in, yeah. in a way that I almost kind of believe him. Yeah, uh, you should. And it's then real. We're yeah. also going to talk about a historical figure by the name of John Brown. <laughs> um, John Brown is famous for doing a lot of really dope shit. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's based as hell, so... He was a radical abolitionist who his act of treason was trying to organize a raid on a Virginia armory so that he could steal weapons to start a slave uprising and turn his home state into a free state where um, slavery was outlawed. Uh, when he was executed, people were so scared of him that they had like a cannon pointed at him and like they, they only hung him, but they still had like all this weaponry pointed at him. And he he believed it was also uh, this is some important context. He believed um, it was sort of a religious kind of a holy war thing. He was very devout. Yeah. And a, a yeah. lot of the early abolitionists did see it through a religious. Context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so for him, it was very much a, this is the work of God kind of thing. John Brown, 1859. Yeah. Guy was cool as hell. And now we're going to tie that together. <laughs> so the Cabbage Preacher <laughs> has written this thing. And I, Dev I, made the, the, the mistake, because he only sent me the Cabbage Preacher bio beforehand and not the thing we're going to get into. He made the mistake of sending me the the link to it before we started recording. But <laughs> uh, So let me just tell you what the title of this is. It's called... His soul is marching on to another world, or the John Brown Isekai. <laughs> and the cover image is in the background. There's an uh, like a '90s style anime John Brown holding uh, a, a cowboy repeater. And in the forefront, there's a dark skinned uh, cat girl in uh, <laughs> United States uh, Union armor, yeah, uh, or Union army uniform, yeah. army uniform. She's got a grenade on a bayonet. Yeah. It's, it's glorious. And then, like, the, the framing around it is made to look like a newspaper from the 19th century. It's incredible. So I, I want to talk about real quick why I love this, because the prose is not great, but that kind of doesn't matter for this kind of pulp fiction. And, and like, here's where I think, like, all of the pretentiousness about literary fiction in writer's circles gets it wrong, because... Pulp fiction, both in the past and as it is now on places like Royal Road being posted online or whatever, it, it serves a purpose of, like, expressing cultural zeitgeist through, like, a sort of a laid-back and kind of buckwild setting. 
Uh, and in this case, this person is talking about that they have taken this historical figure, John Brown, and put them in another world where um, the slaves are cat girls. <laughs> So, I sorry, I saw you react to something earlier. Well, I just scrolled down and I saw I saw uh, some art by a Twitter artist I recognized. Fucking Bal Buddy. And I'm just like, Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> yeah. One of the one of the things that uh, I really enjoy is the top review for this series is it, the title of it is just John Brown on him. <laughs> Just kind of great. So I, I should also say, um, like what an isekai is, pretty briefly for anyone who doesn't know, it's basically it's the kind of worst the... genre of anime. <laughs> well, no, it's a subgenre of fantasy, but a lot of anime fit into the subgenre. It's it's kind of like portal fantasy and things like that. Yeah. Basically, a, a character is transported to another world. And yes, the term isekai itself came from anime and manga, but things like Alice in Wonderland are also an isekai, or uh, The Wizard of Oz, things like that. So that that's the kind of genre of fantasy that we're looking but, but at. The, but the, the thing that this is commenting on is hyper-specifically focused on like the, yeah. the genre of the video game isekai, yeah. which is the worst genre of anime. Yeah, and um, we'll see what the Cabbage Preacher has to every, say every, about that. Every time... Hold, I, hold on, I'm just getting a little defensive, because every time I... I say, I fucking hate isekai. Someone comes in and is like, well, you know that this thing you actually like is an isekai, right? And I'm like, okay, I, yeah, if you want to get pedantic about it, but. Yeah, yeah. I, that's what I, that's what I'm talking about when I say fuck okay, isekai yeah. is like this specific thing. Yeah. yeah. That being said, um, the, the John Brown isekai is a, a series of novelettes. Um, the most recent one, I absolutely love this title. It's called Total Neconomic Collapse. <laughs> Which is brilliant. <laughs> that all being said, um, I'd like to, I mean, if, if you have anything else to say, now would be the time to say it or else I can just jump into this piece. No, I feel like we, ha we have to keep going. Okay, so the, the piece starts out with a prologue that we're going to kind of skip over. Um, basically, it just goes into John Brown's execution and at the end of it, everything fades to black and he wakes up in a new world. I do also want to, the, the Cabbage Preacher themselves posted content warnings on this um, that I feel it would be good to just like. It seems like this guy has a real actual bee in his bonnet about isekai genre. Uh, isekai. They, they might, yeah, yeah. I'm not, let me just, I had the content warnings pulled up somewhere. I don't know where it was. I swear it was like on the front page. There's a Reddit? There is a Reddit for the John Brown isekai. <laughs> There is? Yes, <laughs> there it. is. How many how many fucking people are on it? Hold on. That's so fucking good. <laughs> Come the fuck on the John Brown Isekai. Okay, it seems like the only person who posts on it is Cabbage Preacher. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. I Most love things that. have zero comments on <laughs> I love that so much. I'll just I'll I'll go ahead and jump into the first chapter, but basically for content warnings, the cabbage preacher said something along the lines of like, yes, this does talk about slavery. Keep in mind that this is a laid back fantasy thing. You know, it, it, this is not meant to be like if you find that triggering, you can avoid this, but this is not meant to be like like it, they they purposefully kept it PG is what they were trying to say. Yeah. So it's not going to be anything like violent or detailed or anything like that. It's just it's thematic, you know. So I'd like to jump into chapter one. It's called His Soul is Marching On. Uh, and this comes from a, um, a poem that somebody wrote about John Brown's execution, which the uh, cabbage preachers included here. It goes, old John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, while weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save. But though he sleeps, his life was lost while struggling for the slave. His soul is marching on. Uh, and that's a poem called John Brown's Body by William Weston Patton. The thing I, I, uh, that got turned into glory, glory, hallelujah eventually, right? Or whatever. I, maybe? I'm not sure. I, I, I wouldn't know. Because his soul is marching on was just like a kind of catch-all. And they, it, that's in that song. I, I, I wonder see. what the chronology on that yeah. is, I guess. There's more. There's a couple yeah. more poems that kind of follow a similar um, format that, that go throughout these chapters. But we can jump in. Yeah. So first we get to see exactly how fucking awesome this guy is. <laughs> so 
68th of winter, 5859, Mount Curry as Divai, Kasumonu. Today was a beautiful day like any other. The last few precious snowflakes were slowly floating down to the ground, racing each other in a futile attempt to cover the earth with a thin sheet of heavenly white. The birds had come back from a tactical retreat, celebrating once again the defeat of General Winter. These mountains, <laughs> consisting of earthly dark green with disappearing hints of snow white that were slowly beginning to bring with life, were quite a sight to behold. In the midst of these scenic mountains was a 19th century radical abolitionist, John Brown, <laughs> who had no idea where he was. The scenery around him was too ordinary to be heaven, too unscorched to be hell. He would have loved to ponder the implications of not having died after being killed. <laughs> Yet the old man was currently unable to do so with clear conscience. Brown's physiological needs overrode his need to think about where the hell he was. The old man was currently without shelter and in dire need of finding sustenance. He hadn't exactly eaten much before his hanging, for he, like any other rational man, thought that he should be dead by now. <laughs> Thankfully, Brown is on a plateau that sat on a lower part of the mountains. There are a few trees, newly blooming plants, and plenty of melting snow to serve as water if need be. Cutting through plateau was a desired path, showing that there was larger fauna near the area. Oh, a desire path is um, a naturally occurring thing uh, in nature where, you know how when you're out and you see just like, there's like a dirt road or whatever, and like grass just kind of naturally erodes around, like, mm -hmm. that's what uh, a desire path is, something like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it shows that there's like animals that... Yeah, I yeah. also, I, I want to talk about the quality of the prose here because, like, it's oh, definitely, it's great. yeah, <laughs> it's definitely not somebody who's had, like, training and how to write, but they, like, this is a person who has an idea, a buck wild idea that they want to put out there. And I'm the kind of person who cares more about the, the concept and the execution than about technical skill. I think we talk about that a lot on this show. Things like Tales Gets Trolled, we compared it to One Punch Man, things like yeah. that. The, your, your technical skill doesn't have to be great for something to be great yeah exactly um, that's how i feel about this uh so yeah I'll, I'll jump back in unless you have any comments to make um i don't have any comments to make until we get to the context for the following image okay <laughs> 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 all right his first instinct was to examine the surroundings for anything edible brown saw some bushes nearby that looked like they might contain something of note yet he couldn't recognize the odd green pear-shaped berry that crowned them the other plants in the area looked too, looked nothing like anything he had seen in the American Northeast and Midwest. <laughs> Going around eating strange berries he found on the side of some road would likely lead him to a more than upset stomach, an unwanted psychedelic trip, an early second grave, or all of the aforementioned three if he was to get especially unlucky. Here's the thing. I don't think that that is how John Brown would think about the situation. Probably not. I don't think he'd be like, I'm hungry. Hmm, better ponder the importance of eating berries. Yeah, no. He's too busy being a fucking insane old man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's too busy being absolutely buck wild crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's, it's, it's, that's the... something that we, we, I don't think we talked about enough earlier. John Brown was based as hell because he, he did cool shit, but he was absolutely out of his fucking mind. Yeah. He was, an unstable, crazy person who was, like, violent and made people in his life uncomfortable. By 1800s white guy standards. Yeah, yeah. Too. Yeah, and he, like, even before his execution, he's like, maybe it failed, but, like, I'm gonna die for a larger cause, and that'll get people talking about it. It's like that kind of, like sadomasochism of just like you know i'll martyr myself i don't give a shit there's clearly yeah. a man who's got some... there, there were, it's also like worth saying that he wanted he wanted to be at the center of it too right yeah, like yeah. There, there was he he was cool but also like very unstable and yeah probably I, wouldn't have led a slave revolt if he had lithium yeah yeah T yeah TL <laughs> tldr <laughs> the voice of this uh piece is not necessarily it, it's it's a mythical version of john brown not like the actual John Brown. I mean, the yeah. Cabbage Preacher has like read biographies of him and made notes about yeah. John Brown, but like ultimately this is still in their voice. I, I feel like John Brown, the guy, was a little bit like Mad Max, just kind of like. Yeah, completely unhinged. Yeah. <laughs> in a cool way, though. The next line to me exemplifies like th this tells me. This tells you everything you need to know about the Cabbage Preacher's um, voice as a writer. Yeah. All of the above were, to put it lightly and in the politest of terms, most disagreeable. <laughs> <laughs> Again, 
<laughs> this guy reads a lot of Discworld, and that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> 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 which valid honestly me too yeah. brown decided that he'd first quench his thirst before racking his brain further on the topic of eating thankfully snow was mostly safe to drink without any treatment side note that's not true by the way always boil water if you're in the wilderness don't well, get you. by 1800 standards uh, yeah i guess yeah. so yeah <laughs> he picked a clean pile of snow up from the floor and slowly melted it in his mouth a now a thirst brown noticed on a slight cliff that was reachable with a bit of parkour <laughs> <laughs> slightly reachable with a bit of parkour <laughs> a cave that had blended into the surroundings i can't believe it started with a now a thirst brown <laughs> and ended with parkour <laughs> well now that my whistle is wetted time to do Flips. <laughs> yeah. uh, its small entrance was covered with vines, making it hard to notice at first glance. It seemed like a good shelter, another thing that he currently needed. Brown also needed something to warm him up after having picked up snow with his bare hands. He found a suitable piece of flint discarded next to the road and a dry piece of bark off one of the trees. He took them and climbed to the cave, laying the bark in front of it. The old man took out his belt, which had a prong fashioned out of steel, and struck its prong against the flint. Sparks came flying out of the makeshift fire starter. Soon the bark was on fire. Brown briefly warmed his hands before heading back down to find some dry twigs to further fuel the fire. I know, I have to jump in here. I know that what this author is trying to do is show how John Brown solves problems, but he is right next to a road. You do yeah. not need to sleep in a cave if you are right next to a road because that will lead you to a town. <laughs> a road will lead you to a town. Yeah. Um, where you, you probably find much better resources that okay, being said but, but maybe that is in john brown character to be like hmm, i don't know where i'm at i could be deep in enemy lines i'm gonna hide in this cave and drink snow till i know that the grays ain't coming through here and honestly it's worth it for the next part uh, his grand adventure to acquire a stick or two was interrupted when he ran into three things he couldn't exactly find the words to describe them the closest he could get was Amorphous blobs of jumping transparent liquid with a bluish tint. <laughs> Can I read this next line, please? Go ahead. Brown had been hanged exactly 127 years before slimes ever got popular. I, You need to tell me. I know that's an Easter egg for something. What is it? It's not an Easter egg. That's what it is. Slimes. That's what he's fighting. It's, yeah. It's like a, it's a popular trope in JRPGs. Uh, it started with, I think, Dragon Quest is the most popular one. Interesting, because I had no idea. So, like, I googled, because he was hanged in 1859, that plus 127 is 1986. I googled Slimes 1986, and I got some comic books and a film that was a remake of a different film that came before it. It's so. probably, a, probably a video game, then. Yeah, it's probably a video game. Um, yeah. Cause... Given that the, the, the title of this is the John Brown Isekai, it's probably a video Okay, game. so you know how spooky, scary skeletons are like a trope of like fantasy video game monster? Well, I thought that was a cartoon. A clip from a cartoon. No, but it? like, okay, not literally the song Spooky, Scary Skeleton, but like a skeleton that is spooky and scary. Oh, okay. You know, like is a common enemy type in a video game. Yeah, yeah. A, a slime is is like that. It's animated like goo. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's well, then e that is an Easter egg. Yeah. It's a reference. Um. No, it's not a reference because it's like it's it's like a staple of the genre that he's borrowing from. Oh, he's yeah, doing, good point. Like every first scene in any isekai, he's ripping off is like because it's a video game. A, oh, a then vi one of the game. jokes that happens later is going to make a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah, because, like, a lot of what isekais do to establish, and this is why they're also all cookie-cutter bullshit, <laughs> is because they're trying to appeal to the gamers. The entire first episode is wasted on explaining the mechanics of, like, oh, this is how I find food and water and shelter and fight the first enemy, because that's what you do in a survival video game. Oh, okay. Yeah, but yeah. good media that doesn't suck and isn't boring and isn't gay 
will fucking <laughs> just cut all that bullshit out and have have it be like, oh, someone finds him and takes them to a town or something. Because <laughs> no one fucking cares. Yeah, well. Anyway, they're doing that with John Brown, the historical figure who I got know. executed for starting a slave revolt. <laughs> I mean, but given that this is like they're playing on that trope, yeah. I, I that's what I enjoy about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm just providing some context and yeah. also justifying my hatred of this fucking genre. Fair enough. Uh, he, in great awe mixed with greater confusion, watched the curious creatures hop around, for the creatures were bored of hopping, and decided to tackle the seemingly weak old man that had been rudely watching them. He was definitely not expecting to be tackled by such and balls of goo. The first slime hit Brown so hard that he almost <laughs> fell to the ground. Nevertheless, Brown was not a stranger to combat. The second slime was less fortunate. It met the furious fist of a combat-ready Brown, who now understood that sentient balls of goo were potentially dangerous. And now we get to the image. This image is the one that I sent to Sai in the dead of night after they got home from working an 11-hour shift. (laughs) This is the picture I looked at and I went, nah. (laughs) (laughs) So it's a a pretty crudely drawn um, picture of John Brown punching these slimes and his his fist is like covered in slime goo of one that he's apparently ripped in half there's another <laughs> one in the background looking horrified yeah. <laughs> yeah. tails gets trolled objectively looks better than this yeah yeah although i will say it's like the the cross hatching on it is you can tell he did some more work especially on the beard i don't know i love this appreciate the effort <laughs> this is one of the uh, I don't want to shit on a guy I know. too much. Again, this is but the kind of this thing... This is a lot. This is just so much. <laughs> this this kind of fiction is, uh, in my opinion, very similar to Tales Gets Trolled, because this is a person who didn't bother to, like, start drawing with an apple. They had a story to tell, and they jumped in and started telling it. Yep. And they included <laughs> some illustrations. <laughs> but the thing uh, that gets me is there are other pictures in here yeah that aren't his illustrations yeah like, well this one's just like a, the next image in this is just like a painting of the fucking grand canyon for some reason well he's also included like um old newspapers and things like that he's included a lot of different media to like help him tell the story so i would like to pitch this less as an analog to tales gets trolled and more an analog to a zine a little bit i guess yeah like a, like a self-published like multimedia zine you know about... honestly it seems like that's what railroad.com is for yeah stuff like that so yeah no i i love i love it i, I think it's really interesting it's just yeah. i love just the buckwild concept it's absolutely insane yeah. and unhinged I, I think where this differs between tales gets trolled is that tales gets trolled is first and foremost a visual thing yeah. i feel like laserbot has a little more patience with Seeing his vision come to life than mm. uh, John Brown Isekai guy does. I mean, fair enough, but I, I still love it. That I love. I, it's, just a, <laughs> it's just a different in difference in. Um, yeah, I media. would still say yeah. they both jumped in at the deep end as regards. Yeah, yeah. Creating content. I want, I want to jump back into this though. Yes. The second slime lay defeated, unmoving on the ground. The first slime attempted another attack, but it joined its comrade on the ground after having an impromptu appointment with Brown's other fist. The third slime, clearly the most rational of the trio, ran away from the man who had so viciously slain his comrades in colds, not blood. Having completed the classic isekai ritual of slaying low-level mobs, (laughs) Brown was left with two semi-intact balls of goop on the floor. He was curious about these creatures, he leaned to take a closer look. Oh my god, is he gonna learn how to how to farm mobs for their uh, craftable materials? I think so, yeah. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I hate these guys so much! <laughs> the slime left over from the slimes had consistency similar to honey and also smelled temptingly sweet. Brown wasn't the only one to be tempted. A scaly lizard-like bird with a similar size to an eagle suddenly snatched one of the dead slimes and took off to the skies with it. Brown decided to take the slime that was left over. If a bird could eat it safely, then he should be able to do so too. On the way back to the cave, Brown also completed his mission of finding dry sticks. He made a proper fire by adding aforementioned sticks on top of the burning wood bark. And then he went to his crafting table and using (laughs) three uh, pieces of cobblestone and two sticks crafted a pickaxe to which he would create iron ore and upgrade his house (laughs) to next level. Yes, uh, and warm with shelter and food, 
question mark. Brown had quickly climbed the bottommost floor on the hierarchy of needs. Finally, he had time to do some pondering and planning. He sat in front of the warm fire, thanking the Almighty for providing him with this meal, scooping up bits of slime with his hand while his brain was racked to the fullest. Where was he? Clearly, he wasn't dead, nor was he in the afterlife. This place was most likely not on Earth, either. He had never heard or read about amorphous sentient blobs existing anywhere on Earth. I, I think you could convince an 1800s person that that's just, like, some animal from Africa, though. Yeah, actually, yeah. yeah I think you I, could. I feel, I feel like if he ran into a blob and he's here, he's just like, well, it must be in Minnesota! Yeah, I ain't never been to this part before. There is a lot of parts of this where his logic logic is extremely flawed, um, but I think that's the point. Like, yeah, I don't know. I I like poking holes in it because it's funny. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. It was clear to Brown at least this must be the work of providence. It couldn't be an accident that he was here. Clearly, the Lord must have sent him here for a purpose. So, what tune did the Lord want to play with his instrument? That was the chief question that was currently occupying Brown's mind while he died. And then we're skipping to a uh, different perspective. You want to you wanna read the caption of the next section? Yes, uh, this is the title of the novelette we're following. It's called Fall of the Slave Harem. Yep. <laughs> I love these titles. <laughs> uh, so, today was a beautiful day like any other. The last few precious snowflakes were slowly floating down to the ground, racing each other in a futile attempt to cover the earth with a sh- thin sheet of heavenly white. So he repeats that. I'm gonna I'm tell you. A I told you not. I was about to I'm tell you so not to. Sorry. I was I'm about so to tell you not sorry. to. Put your tablet down. Okay. Turn it over. Okay. Okay. Turn it over. <laughs> <laughs> the famous mountains of curry, consisting of earthly dark green with disappearing hints of snow white, were slowly beginning to brim with life. Were quite a sight to behold. In the midst of these scenic mountains. <laughs> Sai is, like, hemorrhaging, by the way. Uh, Walking on a path was one earthling otherworlder who had been titled Watanabe Generico by the few comrades (laughs) he had acquired. He was a young man with a protagonistly look, befitting his title. (laughs) Short black hair, distinct lack of facial hair, any twig-like physique. Watanabe had been a gamer in his past life. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like a balloon. Yep, having spent many hours grinding for levels in MMORPGs and whatnot, he had gladly accepted the offer made to him after his death to use his gaming skills to save the land of mind plots, or something vague. He wasn't sure what he had been told. Yet the ambitions of Watanabe didn't stop at just a vague notion of quote saving the realm. In his previous li- <laughs> in his previous life. <laughs> Watanabe had never had any chances to have any relationships with women other than his mom and his sister. <laughs> what, what are the implications? Which, thankfully, were not romantic relationships. Okay. He wanted to rectify that <laughs> in this new world. Watanabe you thought- have You have to clarify with Isekai. I don't think you get that, Dev. I know, I know, I know. Gamer culture is a whole thing that I don't understand. Uh, Sword Art Online has an incest subplot uh, that goes unexamined by the text. Wow, I I really don't like that. Yeah. That's weird. I don't remember that because it made me sit through it. I don't remember that. Kirito is a cousin fucker, dude. Was that was that his that was his cousin? Yeah. Oh wow! I I watched this like I want to say like six years ago. So I remember. Yeah. I no, I it. envy you for not internalizing anything about it. Yeah. I don't know. I, it might have been I was only halfway paying attention. I might have zoned out a lot. <laughs> anyway, I want to I want to tell you more about Watanabe Generico. Watanabe thought of himself as the peak of masculinity, an alpha male, if you will. He was a self-declared intellectual, spending copious times watching videos on YouTube and listening to podcasts by self-declared, quote, independent thinkers. He thought, and the people that he listened to told him, that society on Earth must have brainwashed women into ignoring true men like him. What other rational explanation was there for his previous maidenless predicament? (laughs) It couldn't have been the fact that he only showered once a month, nor the fact that he never went outside, and surely this predicament couldn't have come about because he always looked down on any woman he was with. I'm imagining this is just Jordan Peterson calling himself Watanabe Generico. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. 
No, surely a man like him would seem so attractive to the traditional women of this world that he'd soon gather a harem, dot dot dot, right? <laughs> he couldn't really afford to wait, so he had used his heroing money to buy a slave. <laughs> when in Rome, do as the Romans do, is what he thought when he had made the purchase. This, I love this segment, because that's- This is actually- this is good commentary. This is good commentary. Yeah, no, this is because they're following this line of thinking to its logical end. This, this, um, the John Brown Isekai is so fucking based, dude. <laughs> All I'm saying, dude, is like, that's challenging stuff that goes yeah. unchallenged a lot of times in Isekai. Yeah. And this is the great thing about pulp fiction is that it, it challenges these things, but it does so in a really silly premise. <laughs> and it's like, dude, all I'm saying is we dropped John, John Brown in the modern day white house today. <laughs> Redacted. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Like we, maybe we do. Some of these motherfuckers do need a John Brown level reality check. Yeah, maybe they do. So, following him, bound in chains. I'm just imagining John Brown kicking the doors down at an anime convention and just, like, taking pot shots at dudes with <laughs> anime body pillows of underaged waifus. Wait until you see what happens next. Uh, so, this is going to get a little disgusting, but it's going to resolve in a, in a very good way. So, following him, bound in chains, was a slave whom Watanabe simply referred to as rye bread. He couldn't actually bother to learn how to pronounce her name. Her actual name was Kyoto, a woman around two heads taller than him. She could have easily beat Watanabe to death, she really wanted to do so, if she was the one who was armed and not in chains. Other than having someone around him that wanted to kill him if given the chance, Watanabe Generico had another problem. He wanted something sweet to eat. This other world lacked in conveniently accessible sugar found on Earth, an absence of Mountain Dew had been troubling him since the beginning. <laughs> Watanabe seemed to hit the jackpot only in terms of his quest for sweets when he chanced upon a plateau in the lower regions of the mountain. There lay some trees, and under their protective shade laid bushes which had green pear-shaped berries crowning them. Is this edible? I shouldn't put myself at risk, he thought. He plucked one of the berries and would have handed it over to Kyoto if her hands weren't busy being chains, being in chains. Hey, be grateful. Your gracious master is giving you a generous gift. Kyoto recoiled in response. Sir, they are not edible. These are... What, you think you know better than me, woman? I'm a modern, intellectual man from the 21st century. <laughs> you should listen to my wise words. Come on, don't be shy. Say ah. He got a prompt response from Kiata, that being a spiteful spittle of spit being spat upon his now dispirited face. <laughs> wow, that's some pretty decent alliteration, actually. Yeah, how did... Man, how did they come up with that? Um, he was mad, quite mad, frothing even. He raised his generic broadsword to retaliate with unjust punishment, his anger trapping him in a state of tunnel vision. Then, without a chance to even scream or shout anything, Watanabe suddenly collapsed. He hit his head on the cold, hard ground with great force that ended his pitiful life in another world. So he just fucking got wrecked. <laughs> he just Damn. died. Watanabe Generico had failed to notice the fact that John Brown had been slowly sneaking up on him. <laughs> Another mistake. <laughs> that is the greatest line in any piece of fiction ever. Yeah. <laughs> A novice mistake to not be aware of any wild abolitionists while adventuring. Brown had simply done the Lord's work by caving his skull in with a large boulder. <laughs> <laughs> Brown quickly checked the many pockets of Watanabe Generico, finally finding a set of keys. He got up, intending to free Kyoto from her shackles, only to notice she was already a few meters away. She had been doing the same thing by running away from the stranger who had bashed someone's head in a few seconds ago. <laughs> <laughs> Don't skedaddle just yet, shouted Brown. Seeing that she had no intention to approach him, Brown threw the keys toward her as far as he could. Use these, young lady, get those cuffs off. Kyoto paused for a second, leaning down to pick the keys as best she could with her limited uh, movement capability. She then continued her merry way away from Brown, not willing to take chances with the wild man from the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> Brown didn't intend to give chase, it'd probably cause more misunderstandings if he did so. Plus, he had a whole corpse to dispose of now. <laughs> hey, that's good eating, mountain man. Yeah, the whole... 
<laughs> the old man had honestly hoped to get a break in the afterlife where he would finally reunite with all the family he had lost over the years, where earthly sorrow and separation would end under the grace of the Almighty. Brown had considered his mission done when he had sacrificed himself to become a martyr on earth. Yet, if providence had prevented his death, if he had been raised again by the Heavenly Father, then he'd never stop or falter in his divinely ordained mission, not until he finally found himself in front of the pearly gates. Hold on. I just want to say that the implication that this story is providing is that John Brown freeing the cat girls was more important than ending American slavery. (laughs) I don't think that's like... I I, I think that's funny to think about, though. It is, but also, like, given that this is Pulp Fiction, it's not something you're supposed to think that hard about. Like, the Cabbage Preacher themselves, they say that, like... Just, I'm imagining God going and taking John Brown's soul, like, that, like, (laughs) timeline accurate and going... Not yet. You are needed elsewhere. Go. Well, I, the anime women need you. I, I mean, <laughs> like, like that's in still... this story, that's what's happening. It's incredible. Yeah, I mean, if you look at though, like the impact John Brown had in terms of like ramping up, you know, what eventually led to the Civil War, even just him dying like as a martyr still provided quite a lot of momentum to that yeah yeah uh i do want to say another thing that the cabbage preacher does at the end of each chapter that they upload is they include a meme at the end um i I need you to come around and look at this (laughs) oh so now i'm allowed to look i'm kidding (laughs) yeah no this is the one i was reacting to earlier oh okay yeah Yeah, i recommend clicking the original image uh right down there because there is more oh boy yeah um, like I said, I recognized this as soon as I saw it. Oh, so this is an artist you know, is it? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Patreon request. This is complete. This is completely unrelated to the narrative, by the way. He's just taking this out of context because, like, they're both making fun of the same thing in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll you know I'll post a link to this in the description, but yeah, the character like portrayed one of the characters portrayed in this short little comic is like the exact kind of guy that Watanabe Generica was based on. Um. So yeah, that's a, a one one of the the many quirky things that the Cabbage Preacher does with their pieces, and they have other novelettes and, and things like that that they've posted. Um, but that's kind of the first chapter of the John Brown Isekai. That was fucking incredible. It's amazing. And it, you know, it goes on. They, they have posted like a guide to kind of the reading order. Cause again, it's, it's a series of novelettes. It's not really just one contained novel. Cause they, they, John Brown actually gets put into multiple different settings. <laughs> um, so it's so, like a series kind of. Wow. Yeah, there's there's one point when he ends up in Japan. Yeah, anyway, I I adore this for its Buckwild premise and the fact that it is modern pulp fiction. You know, it's uh Yeah, I, I want this guy to write John Brown versus the Moonies. <laughs> 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 that would be good. We yeah. can custom we, let's I'll message him and I'll I'll say like, hey dude. I mean, subscribe to him on Patreon, too. Yeah. He's got a Patreon, um, which I'll include a link to in the description as well, because I, I really want to promo this guy. He's, uh, again, he or they, she, maybe even, I don't know, but they're... they're in Cabbage. Yes, yeah, just... the cabbage, it. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes. The, yeah, a, an excellent creator and kind of, it sort of exemplifies, like, how turning tropes on their head can kind of help you make serious statements even with a silly premise i don't know yeah. this, this is the kind of the, this kind of stuff is the reason i created this podcast <laughs> like right i i really do think that like even badly written fiction ha- can have something very important to say like i take back all of the jokes i made about it earlier the sentence he had failed to realize john brown was sneaking behind him with a large rock that is one of the gr- what, what is it exactly? Watanabe Generico had failed to notice the fact that John Brown had been slowly sneaking up to him. <laughs> that is, th- that is incredible. That this entire thing is worth it for that line alone. Yeah. On top of him having a lot to say. Yeah. You, you can you can tell that this guy definitely like has uh, opinions about the way this this media handles women. You know. Yeah. Yeah. 
by taking this stance on, like, comparing cat girl harems in anime to, like, real life sexual slavery and like yeah. making you actually fucking think about it it's yeah because yeah. like yeah taking an abolitionist from like pre-civil war times is like buck wild concept but also like human trafficking is slavery slavery still yeah. exists now we still have slavery in prisons like it's yeah. you know it, it's actually a thing that like still happens today even though people think it doesn't and so it's worth thinking about how those tropes are portrayed in media uh, it's worth actually exploring that. And if anything, using John Brown to do that as a like as a meme is pretty consistent with the way that he's been like he died a martyr. He he said, I am going to be symbolic of shit. And then there's a bunch of art made about him because of that. Yeah. You know, yeah. and this weirdly this is a modern version of that done to the same level of competency that it was when he first fucking died. <laughs> Just about stupid bullshit. But that same level of, like, knee-jerk reaction to this type of person that this author feels needs punished. Mm -hmm. uh, it's clearly there. Yeah, and, you know, Watanabe Generico is, is one of many of these types of um, characters who get killed yeah. in one way or another. You, you, won you wonder if it's if it's a commentary so mu not so much on the genre of fiction that he finds himself in, but more at the types of people who would yeah. want to identify with that type of protagonist. Oh, I, I guess he's absolutely yeah. referring to that. I, I think also just like talking about it, like incels and kind of the fundamental misunderstandings they have about gender leading to them yeah. identifying with this kind of, you know, it's yeah, there's a I, lot I, of, I'm also just like saying that the isekai genre plays into that with women being written to be all right with the shit that's going yeah, on and therefore yeah. not not bringing up that challenge yeah just, which is why like that's yeah. one of the things that i do like about this is that the cat girls in this clearly do not like it uh there there's a part and, and like again this is why the cabbage preacher put content warnings at the beginning because there are some parts where like it does get really dark because you yeah. do see them actually suffering under this system yeah. uh and you see you also see the rage that they feel in in yeah in bondage like, this clearly this dude clearly has got some opinions yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And one thing I like too, and I think that that might be part of the reason why this person picked John Brown in particular is that John Brown doesn't even necessarily have like a white savior complex about it. I don't know what the real John Brown was like in that regard, but this characterization of John Brown is just like slavery is bad and I'm going to free you and it's not like a, you know, I want to be your savior thing. It's like a yeah. no, you just shouldn't be in chains. Yeah, uh, the 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 type of abolitionist who came uh, at it from a religious perspective. I don't think that race really played into it yeah. for that small subsect of people from that time period. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, it was a very, very, very radical position to take. Yeah. Uh, but people like that did exist. Uh, no, I don't not, know. Not to, not to like, you know, whitewash history too much to like absolve people of their complacency in that system. But like, People during that time were not racist and saying the slavery thing is really fucked up and we should do something about it. Yeah. Especially because there were like black folk who were in society who weren't slaves. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it was an active conversation about an enormous evil that people obviously knew was being inflicted for no reason other than cruelty. And this guy is taking that level of rage about real-life slavery and directing it towards misogynist cat girls. That's yeah. It's genius. Incredible. It's, it's genius. genius. That's, it's, I, like, it's like bringing Dante back <laughs> to make memes about video games right yeah. like the historical dante right yeah yeah and i just the, i also want to talk too just about the originality of this premise it's buck wild it's crazy and that's the kind of media that i absolutely love is somebody takes <laughs> just a this, crazy person and plops them into a normal fucking <laughs> yeah. or just it, like how, who the fuck thinks of taking a real life abolitionist from the 1800s and putting them in an uh, isekai mmorpg like that's utterly insane but he it is they, they make it work they make it's it work. like national treasure 
<laughs> this this is national treasure, but for cat girls. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. I know. You know, uh, historical abolitionist Nick well, Cage. And like, I also I, I mentioned Discworld earlier. I say that because I've been revisiting a lot of the Discworld novels, and that was one of the things that was great about Terry Pratchett, who's like he was able to talk about serious themes and he understood human nature like nobody else did and he was able to talk about that using some stuff that was just patently absurd yeah you know it's just some crazy silly ideas but he was still able to tap into like the, the realities of yeah. the human experience that way yeah um and so i i love seeing that kind of stuff yeah you know yeah, you have your rage and terror moments from being a human slave, but also John Brown sneaks up behind you <laughs> and kills you instantly with a rock. Yeah, just bashes your head in the And then he's just like, holder. well, guess she's afraid of me. Better throw the keys at her and let her go on her merry way. <laughs> yeah. I have no horse in this race. <laughs> yeah. All I did was murder a slaver and I am off to do that again to some other fucking guy. Yeah. Godspeed. It's I- so anime. I know, it's good. I He just Ken Shiro'd this motherfucker <laughs> and, went, and went on to practice more Fist of the North Star. Pretty much, yeah. I've only read oh. a couple of chapters of this. I can't wait to read the rest of it. There are a lot. Um so again there's This is this is also a rare episode that didn't have a break, huh? Yeah, I guess we, we didn't. Just, we just kind of went, th- went through, huh? Yeah, wow. no. It's, that happens occasionally, but the, I mean, this was just such good material, you know? We, we have to keep reading it, right? Uh, no, I, we have enough material for one episode here, I think. No, gonna... I mean, like, for, for future... We have to keep reading this in another episode, right? Oh, this can't just okay. be a one-off. Yeah I, yeah, I mean, we can cover the whole fall of the slave harem if you want to. <laughs> yeah, let's do, let's do a full arc. Let's do a okay. full arc eventually. Okay. I'm teasing it. Yeah, yeah, we'll, it'll, maybe we'll do kind of the same thing we do with Tales Gets Trolled, where we just kind of on yeah. and off come back to it. But yeah, again, link in the description, please go support the Cabbage Preacher for this awesome work that they're doing. Uh, cannot praise it enough. And uh, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, well, I would like to, uh, as always, thank Aria for composing our theme music. Yeah, you can find her on Twitter at 2 Glitch. Um, we've also got links in the description to our socials. Uh, if you want to get ahead on episodes, you can subscribe to me on Patreon. We would like to make an announcement, though. Uh, we're going to be taking a break for the summer. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to be doing a season break for a while just to kind of catch up on stuff. We need a we need to build up our backlog slash just get some more material yeah. for the show. Yeah, and we're also preparing for a, a pretty big event in September. I also, yeah. I, I don't do this enough. I want to promo my uh, webcomic. Please read it. <laughs> the link is in the description. It's called Devil Went Down to Vegas. It's about a demon who gets fired from his job in hell and moves to Las Vegas. What else? Yeah, it's it's very cool and good. And yeah. uh, your your writing is very good. Your characters are great. And your artist is incredible. Yeah. Th- thank you, by the way. But yeah, yeah. Uh, Roman is an incredible artist, by the way. Go commissioner. She's awesome. Yeah. I'm also working on a project with somebody else that might be going up on Webtoon next year. I don't know, I figured I'd just announce that now. And Ooh. Disaster Piece Publishing House exclusive. Yeah, yeah, we're also working on a project with My Immortal. We got a lot of stuff coming up. So, uh Let's see, what else do I need to go over? I feel like that's pretty much all the yeah, housekeeping uh, items. Oh, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell if you're on another platform, please leave a review. And uh like I recommend at the end of every episode, go out there and kill an isekai protagonist and feel, uh, free yes. his cat girl slave. Yes, absolutely. Do it. And we will see you on the next episode. Remember, folks, don't read where you shit. <laughs> <laughs>